Hi everyone, welcome back to another fine week in Astro 322. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about real stellar populations. So when we talk about real stellar populations, we're going to move away from the simple stellar populations of clusters uh, with fixed uh, metallicity and a single formation time. And we're going to move from there into uh, what happens when we consider stars in the so-called field of the galaxy, which is all over, uh, sort of mixed in, a bunch of simple stellar populations added together. So to understand uh, simple st uh, multiple stellar populations or real stellar populations, I want to kind of dive into why this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that you see here from the Gaia collaboration looks different from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for a simple stellar population. So specifically questions like, why are these stars about the same kind of properties as the sun, the most common stars in this HR diagram? So the color here represents the density of stars. And when we say density here, we mean the number of stars found with that combination of absolute magnitude and color. So why are solar stars, one solar luminosity, the most common type of stars? Does this reflect a true uh, uh, property of the stellar population? Or is this shaped by observational effects and other things? Turns out it's the latter. So uh, let's uh, go into this by first thinking about uh, the idea of what we can actually see if we observed in a telescope. And the big thing that shapes our observations is what's called a luminosity bias. We can see faint objects up to a relatively limited distance, and for more luminous objects, we can see them very far away. So as an example, here's uh, a uh, sort of the volume over which a telescope with a fixed sensitivity limit, which means there's a magnitude limit down to which the telescope observes readily. And so it's going to observe to some limit and it can see stars over this range. Whereas for higher mass stars that are more luminous, we can see those stars over a broader range. It's just basically we can see brighter objects farther away if we have a fixed sensitivity. That's the inverse square law of light coming back to get us. And we call this uh, space over which we can see all of these stars, we call this the completeness volume. And that just means the volume of space uh, where we are seeing nearly all of a given stellar type, or more to the point, we know uh, we are uh, we know how many of the stars we are seeing and how many we are missing. Just statistically, uh, we have a sense. So we consider the volume over which a survey is complete. It's set by the properties of a survey telescope, um, and so the you know the better the telescope, the deeper your completeness limit. Uh, the deeper your completeness will be, and therefore you can see the same object farther away, and so it's complete over a larger volume. We can actually figure out the density of the stars in the HR diagram, taking this effect into account, combined with two other things we already know about. So if you think about the number of stars in the HR diagram, uh, we, it comes from these three main factors. So I'm consider this as sort of the ratio between two pipes, types of stars. Uh, and I'll use the textbook uh, example here where I have a high mass star and a low mass star. And I'm going to consider the number ratio uh, that we actually observe. So that's how many stars we see that are high mass and how many stars that are low mass. So if this were for the uh, solar mass stars, they'd uh, be you know a high mass star, and then something like a tenth of solar mass would be a low mass star. And the number that we observe would be changed by um, the this ratio. And so that's a pro uh, or that is recorded in this ratio. And that's a product of three factors. Those three factors are 
When a chunk of stars form through the star formation process, it samples the initial mass function, and we get a relative fraction of the number that are high mass versus low mass that are formed. And that's all the homework that you did last week, and so you're all set to kind of do put those pieces together. So the high mass relative low mass comes from the initial mass function. But we also know from stellar evolution that the low mass stars are going to have a longer lifetime than the high mass stars. And so we have to take into account this effect. So we essentially have that the uh, this number that we observed also scales like the ratio of the lifetimes. So if a low mass star lasts 10 times as long as a high mass star, we're going to have only the more recent high mass stars around, but we'll have 10 times deeper uh, or 10 times longer time to build up low mass stars. And so we'll get 10 times uh, the amount of low mass stars just because they form and they stick around, but the high mass stars are evolving away. Now this limit is not set by stellar evolution necessarily. We reach a cap that's set by the age of the galaxy uh, in which this is in, which we can take as a uh, upper limit for that age is the age of the universe, because galaxies are part of the universe. And so this will never be longer than about 14 billion years for this lifetime, but for high mass stars, it can be substantially shorter. So this gives us one more scaling factor. Then the final thing is that we can actually uh, determine the volume over which we see the high mass stars relative to the low mass stars. And this comes into the uh, observational completeness and the fact that we can see them so far away. And because of the mass luminosity relationship, uh, we can see these high mass stars are very bright and we can see them over very large distances and because it's a volume it comes in like that distance cubed and so while there might not be many high mass stars formed because the imf is steep and decreasing and the there may not be uh, very short lifetimes the fact that we can see these high mass stars over a much wider uh, volume tells us that we can get away with, uh, uh, we can actually overcome some of the limits of the IMF and stellar lifetimes to still see lots of high mass stars. Okay, let's work through that in the case of an example. So I want to work this out by means of an example. Uh, so here what we're going to do is we're going to consider uh, what happens if uh, we have a the Gaia mission, which can detect stars down to an apparent magnitude of uh, 15. And we want to consider that with respect to an absolute magnitude star of with mg of 15. And we ask how far away could Gaia detect that star. And so uh, that corresponds to, if you go back into the back of your book, that corresponds to something slightly below uh, the fusion boundary. So we ask how far away can we see this? And this is an application of the distance modulus formula, which says that the apparent minus the absolute magnitude is 5 log 10 of the distance over, let's try to construct a 10 a little bit better, uh, 10 parsecs. Okay, and so we plug in 15 minus 15, which is uh, 0, is equal to 5 log 10 d over 10 parsecs. And from there, I can uh, divide by 5 and exponentiate to get 1 is equal to d over 10 parsecs. And so the distance is equal to 10 parsecs. So this says that we can see that star reliably out to a distance of a mere 10 parsecs, kind of a small scale on a galactic level. But let's consider what happens if we ha and see stars uh, that are up at a high mass end of the uh, stellar properties. So something like a 50 solar mass star, which has a uh, Gaia absolute magnitude of minus 5, but we're still observing it with the same telescope, so it's a G-band magnitude of uh, 15. And there I apply my distance modulus formula, G minus mg is equal to 5 log 10 d over 10 parsecs and then i will put in 15 minus a negative 5 is equal to 5 log 10 d over 10 parsecs and from there that's uh let's see here that's 20 divided by 5 is equal to log 
10 d over 10 parsecs. And then I can raise that 4, so that's 10 to the 4. 10 to the 4 is equal to log. Oh, no, no more log. That's the whole point of raising it to 10 to the 4. Just d over 10 parsecs. Now, or d is equal to 10 to the 5 parsecs. That's 100 kiloparsecs substantially larger than the scale of our galaxy. So all else being equal, we can see the low mass end of the main sequence out to 10 parsecs, which is a tiny little bubble around the sun. And we can see the high mass stars throughout the entire galaxy. So this is the big difference is we see every high mass star and we see a very limited number of low mass stars. And that's what accounts for the different densities of points in the HR diagram. So the reason why we get uh, the, this is why we get the uh, high mass star or why we get the solar stars being the most common is the combination of these two effects. There's more brown dwarfs, but we don't see a lot of them. There's very few high mass stars, uh, the very, very few high mass stars, so we don't see a lot of uh, them, even though we see them from all over. But the solar mass stars are kind of right in that Goldilocks spot of we see them for very large distances and we uh, and there are relatively a lot of them. So, uh, going back, uh, if we look at this and we compare our example for the high mass star over the low mass star, it's uh, you know it's a factor of ten to the four in distance, and that means that the volume is ten uh, you know a trillion times larger for the uh, bright stars relative to the faint stars or the high mass stars relative to the low mass stars, and so this balances these two effects. Essentially, we are limited by the scale of the galaxy. We'd have way more high mass stars in our survey uh, relative to low mass stars if the galaxy was a uniform extent and stretched out to kiloparse hundreds of kiloparsecs or a megaparsec or something. So, uh, you know, this, it, you know, we have a bit of a competition also with the short lifetimes of the high mass stars, and so that will also reduce their relative frequency. Uh, so in the book, I walk through a more numerical example of these three factors and how they all play in uh, to uh, play into an observed HR diagram, but we do just remember that the density of stars is the observational selection, which is what we've covered here. Uh, how many stars have formed over time? More on that a little later. And then the lifetimes of stars at this particular stage. So uh, gives us those pieces, and now we understand why Sol Gaia uh, sees mostly solar mass stars, uh, even though they are not the most common star in the galaxy. Okay, so uh, looking over, our next thing we want to talk about in real HR diagrams is dust. Now, dust is a, uh, it's basically, it's stuff in the way of stars. And we are going to care about dust for two reasons. Uh, first here, we're gonna talk about it blocking the light. And then in the next chapter, we're gonna talk about how that blocking of the light changes the radiation environment in a galaxy and actually reshapes its evolution. So right now, let's focus on the dust's effects on studying stellar population. Now, dust is uh, basically small grains of soot uh, and other carbonaceous and silicate products that are mixed through the neutral gas of the galaxy. And dust does kind of three things, or it has three main observational effects we need to keep in count. Uh, first, it blocks light. Uh, it's the stuff that gets in the way. Second, it preferentially blocks blue light relative to red light, or more generically, short wavelength light relative to long wavelength light. And then that radiation that gets blocked, absorbed, then re-radiates in the infrared. And so that changes the observed spectrum of a galaxy. So let's talk about how this all affects this and you build up some of the language we use to discuss this in the context of uh, dust extinction in stellar populations. So, the neat thing uh, I want to highlight is this lovely image uh, here showing the effects of dust in different observational bands. These are labeled here. So this is BVI and BIK. So K is a near infrared band, then B is blue, V is in the yellow, I is in the near infrared, and then K is longer wavelength than that. And so this, uh, these are three color images that are composited from these three filters 
The blue light corresponds to the first filter. The green light in this image corresponds to the middle filter. And then the red light in this image corresponds to the last filter. And here they've just replaced the red light with this even longer wavelength filter. And when you do that, pop, out comes all these stars in the background. And this is just illustrating that in this K band, the, near, the you know, this near infrared band that's at around two microns, you can see straight through the dust of this galaxy uh, or dust of this little cloud in our galaxy and see the stars behind it. So it's fantastic because this uh, long wavelength light allows us to see through these clouds or because it is less blocked than the other light. Uh, than the blue light. So um, keeping that in mind, let's figure out how much light actually gets blocked. And we're going to do this by means of an example that's really a derivation. Uh, so what you see here is uh, a example sort of cylinder of uh, space and light is flowing into this cylinder of space and it's going to exit on the far end. So we have, you know, light comes in over here and then it exits over here. And in doing so, its power is going to change by some amount delta P. And it's going to change because there's these dust grains here in the middle of the region uh, of this volume of space. We want to know the proportion of light that gets blocked, or basically the amount of light that gets blocked. And I'm going to make the uh, contention, uh, given this and our lovely three dust grains here, that the ratio of the power, this is the physics reasoning here, uh, that comes out the back end relative to the power that goes in the front end is proportional to the amount of that cylinder when viewed end on that gets blocked so that by the particles. So it's going to basically be the area of the cylinder minus the number of particles that are in the way times the area of those particles when you're projecting them. So if they're spherical grains with radius r, the area that they're going to block, basically the shadow that they cast, is going to be the cross-sectional area of those, which is called, uh, or which is just pi r squared. And so that's the power coming out, or is going to be proportional to the ratio of the area that's blocked over the original area. So the thinking here is if we look at this little uh, uh, cylinder end on, what we'd see here is there are these three little dust grains here, and they're going to block out the light over a small area. And we just want to figure out what fraction of this area, cylinder viewed end on, is occupied by those dust grains that are going to be blocking the light. And uh, so we figure that out and we need to just know the number of dust grains. But if you go back to the problem, I asked, these are spherical dust grains and they have a radius R and a number density right here, a number density uh, in this cylindrical beam of light carrying power P. Uh, so to figure out the number, I have to figure out the number of dust grains, uh, number density of dust grains multiplied by some volume. And I could be kind of clever and just, or I could be naive, let's start out naive, and I could just say, okay, the volume of the cylinder is just the area times the length of the cylinder, or the cross-sectional area, or the sectional area of the cylinder A times the length of the cylinder. Done. You could say that's uh, all good, except if the cylinder has enough particles in it, they'll, they will eclipse each other. And so one dust grain will appear in front of another dust grain in this setup. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to consider only, oops, uh, uh, we're going to only consider a tiny little area here. Uh, so we're going to really focus in on this differential length there. And we're going to make the argument that the power plus, oops, let's go back to red now that we're talking, the power in that minus 
some little bit of power, and I'm going to go from delta p to d, or plus a little bit of power, go from uh, delta p to dp to indicate it's tiny, it's differentially tiny, over the power, same kind of reasoning, is just going to be the area minus the number of particles in that volume. Now I'm going to consider it only over this little dl, and then it's the number times the area of the cylinder times dl, and that's just the number of particles times their area. So this is the number from the previous, and that's all divided by the total area a. So what's happening here is uh, we are considering a tiny little area, and in that area, which can be even smaller than a dust grain, or the, the dl can be smaller than r, uh, we're going to consider the number of particles. It might be a fractional number, but that's okay. Probability comes in, and that's how we get a fractional dust grain is, you know, what's the likelihood of it being in this volume? So from here, we can just do some algebra. So the physics reasoning is done, and we're up to some math here. So I'm going to uh, calculate. I'm going to divide this by P. So we get 1 plus dP over P is equal to, again, I'm going to divide by A, so uh, that's going to give me 1. Ooh, that's, that's going to give me a highlighter. That's, I want 1 minus, okay, uh, N times A times pi R squared times DL all over A. Those A's cancel, goodbye. Uh, they're done. And then I have a one on both sides, and that also cancels. So I'm left with the equation that says that dp over p is equal to negative n pi r squared dl. And so to figure out, this is the power loss in a tiny little sliver of this cylinder, right up here. This section right here is what we considered. Instead, we want to consider the whole cylinder uh, going through here. So what I'm going to do to get up to the whole cylinder is add up the losses from each uh, tiny uh, section. If I'm adding up something tiny, that's not a sum. You know the story. This is an integral. So I'm going to integrate this, and I'm going to integrate this specifically from the initial power to the final power, or the initial to the final. Uh, we'll just call that one p. And then I'm going to integrate the right-hand side over the length of the cylinder, 0 to l, so the full length here. So if I do this uh, integral, uh, dp over p, then it integrates to the natural log of p over p naught. And then I'm going to integrate this other side. It's just pi r squared and n are all constants. So we bring out minus n pi r squared. Integral of dl from 0 to l is just l. And so now we have a formula. I'm going to go ahead and solve for p. And I'm going to say that p is equal to p naught times e to the minus n pi r squared l. So that gives me the all the uh, sort of relationship I need given a um, sort of, you know, dust grain population, each of which has an area uh, pi r squared. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to not write pi r squared in my final answer. I'm going to define pi r squared as something a little more general. I'm going to give it a, another sigma. Uh, it's a variable sigma. And I don't know, we've got like five or six sigmas in this course. This one means the cross-sectional area of the, the uh, particle, and we'll just call it the cross-section. And so then we can say that this is secretly p naught minus n sigma l. So great, we have derived the relationship between the input light and the output light given the dust in the line. So this diminishes the flux, it diminishes the luminosity of the stars as they are uh, kind of as the light is passing through it. So this gives us our, um, uh, this basically gives us a relationship to what happens to starlight as it passes through dust, specifically the flux of the star that's behind a dust screen relative to one that's not. So uh, flipping back, let's uh, consider that we, uh, we have some variables here. We often call this product that's in the exponential, we call it the optical depth. And so given this, it's, you know, the uh, 
light is diminished by e to the negative tau, where tau is the optical depth of the uh, star uh, of the dust. And so that's just this product here. I've given it a little subscript of lambda because it actually can vary with wavelength. That's the reddening that we're talking about. And so we can take into account of that there. And what we'll do is we're actually usually dealing with magnitudes. And so we can actually convert between optical depths and magnitudes. And you can see the math for how this works in the textbook. And it's just basically a scaling factor. A magnitude is about 10% smaller than an optical depth. So 1.086 times the optical depth gives me the magnitude number of magnitudes of extinction there is. So we usually give this the variable A. Okay, and that's uh, all well and good. And it's worth noting that the cross section need not be for a hard sphere. It may not even be particularly well defined be at, uh, by the geometry of the object because really what it's doing is it's tracking how photons interact with a uh, dust grain. And that can be weird because these dust grains are you know, tens, hundreds of nanometers across. They have these weird kind of flaky structures. So the optics of how a photon hits a dust grain and scatters off it, gets absorbed by it, is weird because all these things are smaller to or comparable to the light that's interacting with them, uh, the wavelength of the light that's interacting with them. So you get some strange optical effects and we need to kind of track those in the optics of the dust grain. We thus move beyond a uh, simple, like, you know, it's a spherical grain, to the idea of a probabilistic cross section. And this shows up a lot if you've seen like the Rutherford experiment in uh, a modern physics class. It's the same reasoning that comes up here. Uh, and what we do for the Rutherford experiment is we actually define a cross section kind of in a weird way. We just find it as if we think about a bunch of things going into the you know, photons going into the cylinder, we think about that as the number of collisions that we get uh, by those photons running down the cylinder divided by the number of possible targets. So it's basically what's the likelihood if I throw a bunch of stuff through there that we will get a uh, interaction. So number of interactions divided by the number of targets. And we're going to normalize that by the number of incident particles divided by the area of the hallway. So this isn't this is just A for area, not A for extinction. Uh, and so this is basically the probability that you'll get an interaction divided by basically the flux of the particles coming in, number coming in per area. And so when we get that sigma is equal to pi r squared, we call that the geometric cross section. But optics means that the real cross section may not be the geometric. To give you sense of this, I'm going to talk about the worst way to measure the size of a watermelon. Literally the worst. The physics experiment. And it's a physics thought experiment. So imagine, put yourself into this view where we have a nice long hallway. And that hallway has a bunch of watermelons suspended in it. So if we think about this hallway here, ooh, this is kind of funky. Ooh, nope, let's go down here. All right. So there's a hallway, and I have a bunch of watermelons in it. I think, uh, let's see here, watermelons are green, right? Yeah. Can I tell green routinely from a color palette? Nope. So it's all these watermelons in here, and they're suspended from the ceiling. And this hall has a cross-sectional area of 10 meters squared. Oops, that's not a 10 at all. 10 meters squared. So 3.16 by 3.16 meter hallway, got a water, bunch of watermelons set up, and then you, you, uh, sure, you, this may excite or uh, horrify you, uh, would then, uh, will be issued your trusty physics laboratory, AK-47 automatic rifle, and a clip with 100 bullets, which you will stand at the end of the hallway, uh, and then somehow induce randomness, so you fire them randomly at different positions down the hallway, 
And then afterwards, when you recover from whatever introduced the, your randomness, um, you walk down the hallway and you find that 35 watermelons have exploded. Uh, so this is essentially a physics experiment on a macroscopic scale. We do this all the time in particle accelerators, uh, but this is what happens if you decide to make a particle accelerator to measure the size of a watermelon. Well, uh, here we will hop back to our uh, formula, which says that the cross section is equal to the number of collisions that happen over the number of targets. And then we're going to divide that by the number of incident uh, particles, the bullets, over the area of the hallway. And at this point, it's just plugging in the numbers. There were 35 colli collisions out of a possible 70 targets. And of those 70 targets, the number of incident uh, thing, uh, things are coming in. There were 100 bullets. And the cross-sectional area of the hallway was 10 meters squared. So it's neat. All of these are numbers, except for the 1 over area squared in the denominator. And so that comes up, and you get cross-section units of area. And so that's uh, 35 over 70 is a half. 100 over 10 is tens. It's in the denominator times meters squared. So this is 1 20th of a meter squared or 0 0.05 meters squared and you ask yourself what kind of watermelon is that well you find that r is about 12 centimeters so it's a sort of standard size of watermelon congratulations you've measured the watermelon in the worst possible way uh, but this is as i said how actual particle accelerators and the optics of light care about uh, cross-section. It's this probabilistic sense. Okay, so that gives us the framework for actually talking about uh, extinction uh, in terms of magnitudes, cross-sections, and how you would actually calculate it if you knew the properties of the dust grains. Uh, but from here, let's go and talk a bit about reddening, because this is where extinction really gets going. Uh, so reddening occurs because the extinction in one wavelength is going to be larger than the other wavelength if that first wavelength is shorter than the second. So basically, blue light interacts more with red light. Uh, or uh, blue dust blocks blue light more than red light. Uh, so specifically, dust uh, blocks light like a uh, 1 over lambda uh, relationship. So, you know, if you have the wavelength, the dust's cross-section gets twice as big. Same dust grain, it's just the optics of how that light is interacting with the dust grain, it becomes twice as effective at blocking the light. So it's kind of, you know, a larger target at short wavelengths. Uh, and the scattering of light goes like uh, 1 over lambda to the fourth. So this is even stronger effect at short wavelengths. So, what does this actually look like? Well, when we talk about this in the spirit of astronomical nomenclature, we're usually talking about uh, the reddening law or the reddening curve. And this kind of, uh, this figure takes a moment to unpack. So let me explain uh, what's going on here. This shows the reddening law and it's tracing the relative extinction of dust in one band to another. Here we've reverted to using A is extinction here. And so what we're seeing in this graph is the extinction at some wavelength relative to the extinction at V band. So notice it goes through one here at a wavelength of about 550 nanometers. And this is plotting one over the wavelength in microns. It's basically proportional to the wave number if you've done any optics. And so that's why they plot it like this. Okay, so what you'll see, given we have this weird in 1 over wavelength uh, units, is that the extinction is rising as 1 over lambda gets larger, which of course corresponds to the wavelength getting shorter. So high extinction, short wavelength, kind of what we'd expect, but this actually shows the relationship here. Uh, so this is um, uh, illustrating a phenomenon that we call as reddening. And I mean, I stress in the book, and I'll stress it all the time, reddening is a bad description for it. This is debluening because you are blocking out light. You are not changing light from blue light to red light. 
uh, in the optical. There, you know, you can think about it in the infrared as you know some sort of transmogrification of the wavelength of light. But you are preferentially blocking blue light relative to red, so things appear redder in the optical just because you've knocked out more of the blue light. But the red light is also diminished. Uh, so reddening is kind of a poor choice of words for it, but it's the ones that we use, kind of the theme of this course. Bad decision in hindsight. Uh, life. Anyways, uh, so what we have is a long uh, sort of rising relationship here uh, that shows uh, that extinction gets stronger at shorter wavelengths. What we specifically do is we characterize this using a reddening value. And this is usually talked about in terms of a variable RV, which is the ratio of the extinction in the V band to the difference in extinction in the blue band minus the V band. So RV is defined as this value here. This thing at the bottom is often called the color excess or E B minus V. And the, what was neat about this is if you look at all of these curves, they all kind of have a slope value for this ratio of how much stuff there is relative to the slope of this curve. So basically it's giving you a, uh, you know, basically a difference uh, here. So that value has a ratio of about 3.1. And it's just encoding how one, uh, how this extinction is a little bit larger. So it's up by a third or one over 3.1 magnitudes is as we go from the V band right here up to the B band. So what this is encoding is the slope of the extinction. And you might think, that is a ridiculous thing. Why would you ever do that? And the answer is, this is exactly the thing that you want if you're analyzing the effects of dust in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So let's take a look at our favorite Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, namely the one from the Gaia collaboration. And this is one I haven't shown you yet, but this is the actual HR diagram that you observe if you go out and you measure all the stars from Gaia and you make the plot of all the nearby stars and you plot them, you see this mess here. And you see the effects of dust writ large across this HR diagram. No, And you can see, let's pay attention to the red clump here. You notice how it's basically smeared out here. It's sort of drawn down in this uh, uh, direction. And that's because we're seeing the effects of dust extinction. If we're behind a foreground screen of dust, we're going to have the star appear fainter. So it's apparent magnitude, which I then correct using parallax to an absolute magnitude, will be larger because it's fainter. Bigger magnitudes, fainter. So that drops us down. So a star with a true location up here will appear lower, but it also blocks the blue band light more than the red band light and so the blue band extinction is going to get, or the blue band magnitude will get larger relative to the red light, and that's going to shift the star to the right. And everything is going to fall along a specific ratio determined by the dust. And that's called the reddening vector. And if you want to figure out the rise over run of this particular slope for a given extinction, why that's the reddening. That's the G band over A, B, P minus R, P for this diagram is 1.8. And so if dust induces one magnitude of extinction downward, it also shifts the color to the, or sorry, if the color is moved over by one magnitude, that's going to shift the magnitude down by 1.8. Let me say that the other way, which is if I move down 1.8 magnitudes, uh, it's going to shift my color one to the right. So there we are. That's basically the slope of these streaks in the HR diagram. And the more that you are drawn out along this reddening vector, the more the extinction. And so this actually gives us the tool by which we can unwind the effects of extinction in the HR diagram. Essentially, you can take a star and figure out where it should be. You're like, this looks like a red clump star. How much did I have to move out along this vector to get from where the red clump should be 
to where this star actually appears in the HR diagram. And that tells you what the dust extinction is. And then this is cool. So if you know the dust extinction to the star, and you also know the parallax of the star, you know its true distance, you can figure out how much dust there is between us and a star. That's pretty cool. But you can then find a star near that star that's a little farther away and figure out the same thing for it, how much dust is between it and there. And then you can figure out the amount of dust as the difference between those two dust measurements that lies between the first star and the second star. And so this allows us to use parallax to actually map out a three-dimensional distribution of where the dust is in the galaxy as well as the stars. And so that's actually what this uh, group at Harvard has been doing. This is uh, uh, working with um, uh, the group of Doug Finkbeiner, whose uh, epigraph appears in the uh, front of your book uh, about research. Uh, my former grad school office mate, uh, and uh, that's one thing he told me, and it always has stuck with me. Anyways, uh, Doug is off uh, sorry, Professor Finkbeiner is off uh, working out, uh, and his group are working out the dust distribution of extinction uh, in the nearby interstellar medium. And this is a map of that, and it kind of looks like a, a mess here. Uh, and you can see that the dust is really patchy. It sort of fills up all of these uh, individual spots, and it looks a little streaky. Uh, that's because this is actually a three-dimensional uh, distribution of the dust. And so what I'm going to do is animate this wonderful movie that was made by their team. And it sort of gives you a pair, uh, a sort of a multi-view uh, that illustrates that these are three-dimensional structures. Don't look at that. It will terrify you. Let's go look at it. Uh, so you can sort of see that there are these clouds here. And so they actually have animated this wonderful sort of three-dimensional uh, structure. And so what Gaia is telling us is not only where all the stars are in the galaxy, it tells us where all the dust is. This is a method. We're going to stick that into our toolkit, and we're going to come back and understand the galaxy as a whole using some of these methods. All right, so that explains how dust is used in a... Um, resolved Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. In an unresolved Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, dust has similar effects, but it plays out in our observational space differently. So what we're seeing here is that this is showing the uh, flux density from a galaxy. This is a model galaxy that I created using a code. And what was showing you see this is the uh, flux density of a galaxy as a function of wavelength. Uh, over here will be the ultraviolet. Over here is the infrared, and then the optical is this section right in here. Uh, oh, sorry, the optical is this section right in here. So ultraviolet, uh, optical near infrared, and uh, far infrared. So what we can see here is this bluish curve is showing us the light from the galaxy without any dust. This is just what we would see from the stellar population itself. This orange curve is illustrating what happens when I put dust into the model. And you can see the two effects that I'm talking about. First, this light is knocked out proportional to the extinction of the dust. And you might look at this and you say, well, where did this little dip come from? Uh, if you were paying attention back on this slide, you will see that there was a bump right there at about 250 uh, nanometers. And you come back here, and you see that indeed at around 250 nanometers, a little less, uh, it knocks out, has a bump that's a little higher in extinction, so more of the light gets blocked out. So you can sort of see that, uh, even though the true stellar population is knocked out. So the bluest light gets diminished the most. This is a factor of 1 to 300, 500 uh, gets knocked down at this end. And then that factor gets smaller and smaller as I go to longer and longer wavelengths. So these curves converge to each other. Until I get out here to something like two or three microns, and there's hardly any effect of the dust on the starlight at all. It's a few percent effect or something like that. And uh, all through here, we get a very good representation. We can see through the dust because it doesn't absorb any of the light. But then as we get out a little farther, 
we start to see the other effects of dust. So all the light that was taken from this part of the spectrum gets moved out here into the mid and the far infrared of the galaxy. And so what we're seeing here is this is the re-emission from the dust lines. There's some uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon emission here, and then we have some continuum emission from dust grains there. So this is just illustrating what do we see when we get stuff out of the galaxy, uh, and it's uh, with and without dust. Uh, so we see the full effects on the unresolved population, and we can use what we know about star formation populations, the distribution of dust, to kind of unwind and figure out how much dust is in the galaxy, as well as the stars in the galaxy. All right, so we can actually figure out the final piece of the puzzle, which is the star formation history of a, gal uh, of a galaxy. So when we're actually looking at the density of stars on the HR diagram, we've kind of been implicitly assuming a very naive model for the star formation rate. So if we go back to our observed model uh, of stars uh, here, this star number of stars that were formed actually is sensitive to uh, the number of stars that are formed combined with the star formation lifetime actually depends on whether uh, or determines the number of stars observed. So let me give an example here. Uh, let's say we have a stars with very short life that we're comparing to stars with relatively long lifetimes. Uh, if we have recent star formation, we're going to see the number set by the IMF and we see all those stars. But if star formation has sort of stopped and only happened in the distant past, then this factor doesn't actually matter. We won't see any high mass stars because they age out of the, of the population and they just uh, disappear. So the actual star formation history regulates the interaction of these two terms. And we've kind of swept that under the rug up to now, uh, but we do have to note that this is a significant effect and it's set by the star formation rate, which I'll use the variable m dot star of t. And so the number of stars on the main sequence at a given mass n is uh, the fraction of stars that the IMF uh, predicts uh, there. Uh, and then it's the integral from the beginning of the stellar system to the end of uh, the time that you're observing it of the number increase of the stars, so n dot, and that's just the star formation rate per unit mass divided by the actual mass of the star. So fm is just the fraction of stars that the IMF makes, and then this factor here is taking into account the uh, changing star formation rate history. So, um, so t stop here is basically going to be the main sequence lifetime or the age of the universe, depending on whether its limit it is shorter or the main sequence lifetime is shorter or longer than the age of the universe. So basically, we uh, you know stop our uh, we stop our analysis at the age of the universe, irrespective of what kind of stars we're looking at for the low mass stars. And what's neat about this is it allows you to infer the star formation rate versus time. I'm actually, you know, there's a bit of a write-up in the book, and I asked you to do a homework problem on this. So I'm not going to walk through the logic of this here. I'd like you to actually think about how this works. I'm going to show you some of the benefits of the analysis. Uh, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of one of our nearest galaxies. This is M33, uh, which is called the Triangulum uh, Galaxy. And so this is the panchromatic Andromeda treasury, um, and that's a triangulum extension region. Uh, so it's uh, abbreviated FATTER. I think I've forgotten an HST in here when I write out FATTER. Uh, and so this is a beautiful map of, into, of stars here, and it's observed with HST, so it has excellent uh, resolution. And so when we look at it, we can actually zoom on this little box here. And what we see is we see as we zoom in, and this is like a quarter resolution image. It actually, you know, I didn't want to break my laptop uh, here, but you're seeing individual single stars. And this allows us to construct hertzsprung russell diagrams for tiny patches of this galaxy, like this one. And we can measure all of the different stars in here and construct a hertzsprung russell diagram. From there, we can ask how many stars are of a given mass. 
uh, in that HR diagram relative to stars with, say, a shorter main sequence lifetime. And what that allows us to do is figure out whether that ratio is consistent with the IMF. If it is consistent with the IMF, you know that the star formation rate's been kind of constant through time, and you can use the number of stars you see to predict the actual mass of star formation, uh, star formation rate mass. But if it's not consistent, that means that the uh, star formation rate is changing over time. And so you can use variations in the number of stars that you see relative to the fractions that are predicted from the main sequence lifetimes and the um, uh, main sequence lifetimes and the numbers that you predict from the IMF uh, to back out what the star formation history is of the system. And for this galaxy, Here's what the star formation history looks like. It gives us this little trace. This is a logarithmic time scale because the masses of stars uh, are sort of change logarithmically. Uh, uh, and so we need a logarithmic scale to kind of track the variations here because of that power law scaling in the um, uh, main sequence lifetime. And so the density of different stars uh, are allow us to reconstruct this. And we see that actually M33 has had a very high star formation rate over the past few million years relative to its average. It's almost doubled for some reason. And then there's all these little bumps up here. And so it's not constant, but it was pretty constant. But something is driving up the star formation rate in the galaxy uh, recently. So that gives us our... Um, uh, that gives us a bit of the star formation history of the galaxy, and you can sort of neat that you can look back in time and can, uh, figure this out. But what's also pretty neat about this is that uh, if you look at this, you can actually slice this into stars that are formed in the most recent 50 million years, or the star formation uh, history uh, of you know how much star what is the star formation rate locally over the past 50 million years and what was it before that in the same parts of the galaxy and what's neat about that is you can see that there's all this kind of patchy um star formation recently uh but if you look there's actually this beautiful barred spiral pattern in the star formation rate uh for uh the like back in time and so if we go back uh, over this long period of time, the star formation rate was tracing this kind of more regular pattern uh, and spread out over the galaxy, whereas this is uh, really these sort of single patchy features here. This is low resolution because we're taking this gorgeous data set and chunking it up into tiny uh, into patches that have to contain enough stars to construct an individual HR diagram. So, we can do a similar trick by looking at uh, the uh, unresolved flux density from a galaxy, and we can actually just fit models to it. And here's uh, two different models uh, of a star formation history for a given galaxy. I've shaded the optical region here. And you can see that if I have something that forms the same amount of stars when all's well and done, but it's undergone an exponential decay versus a constant star formation rate, we get different light out uh, in the galaxy. And so we can use the full spectral information and these different models of the star formation history to actually predict uh, what, how, or we can measure how the light of a galaxy agrees with the different star formation rate models and then uh, unpack and figure out what those uh, star formation uh, histories actually were. So it's pretty neat. We can do these resolved and unresolved star formation histories and probe over a very long section of the lifetime of the galaxy what the star formation rate is. Okay, so this gives us a sense of how we'll actually measure a lot of things having to do with a stellar population and all the information that we can get out of it, the distribution of dust, the star formation history of, a gal of the entire galaxy, all these pieces come together uh, from observations of resolved stellar populations. All right, uh, so that concludes what I want to talk about for this week, and uh, we'll go and take a look at some Gaia stuff next.